So this is going to be a follow-up to a video we put out just recently to answer the question, is it impossible for a reprobate to be saved? Well, in this follow-up, uh, shortly after we put out that last video, someone else asked the question, well, what if a reprobate wanted or calls out to God to save them? Could, could, could they get saved? Well, here's the thing. If, if someone called on the Lord for salvation and they truly want to be saved, that would prove that they're not a reprobate. Because in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, the Bible explains to us, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. So the reason why someone becomes a reprobate is because they have rejected God. They have made up their mind to not retain God in their, in their knowledge. They're not going to have anything to do with God. They may not even believe in a God. Okay, so again, let me repeat. If someone were to call on Jesus Christ for salvation, that would just prove that they're not a reprobate. So, one thing to bear in mind, we know that God is able to save to the uttermost. We know that the Lord can save the chiefest of sinners. Paul made that very clear. Let me give you a good way to, to look at it. Remember the story of the maniac of Gadara? You can read about it in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And uh, in that story, the Lord, he casts out this legion of devils out of this wild individual who was running through the cemetery late at night, cutting himself, suicidal, just untamable, just a maniac. Uh, a wild man that no one could tame, no one could, could, could control him. They would try to chain him up with chains and fetters. Uh, he would break him, showing that be, because of the demon possession, he had supernatural strength. I mean, uh, this was a wild situation, but the Lord shows up and the Lord commands the demons out of him, as you know, and the Bible goes on to tell us in that story that when the Lord casted out those demons, that he transferred those or, or he allowed those demons to possess 2,000 pigs that ran off into the water, into the river, and uh, drowned themselves to death. And so when, when the Lord, when, when that group of demons identified themselves to the Lord, they had a name for themselves. They called themselves Legion. Well, Legion is a military terminology for the ancient Roman army of that time, the times of the Roman Empire. And a legion could be, a legion of soldiers would be anywhere from a, a troop of 2,000 to up to 6,000 soldiers. And so the fact that there were 2,000 pigs that were possessed by the demons that had once possessed that maniac who was now set free by the Lord, that's a strong indication that that uh, maniac was possessed by at least 2,000 devils. Now, take a second to think about that. A demon-possessed man with at least 2,000 devils in him, and the Lord miraculously sets him free from that bondage, that demon possession. 2,000 demons. Can you imagine being possessed by 2,000 demons? That was the situation of the maniac of Gadara, but yet the Lord Jesus Christ was so powerful, is so powerful that he can cast out up to 2,000 demons. Maybe it was more, who knows? Uh, and so the point I'm trying to make, you know, I, I've used this to kind of jokingly illustrate to folks that 
no matter how bad off you are, you could be the vilest of sinners. But if you have anything less than 2,000 devils in you, I know for a fact that the Lord could set you free. <laughs> and so let's say you have 100 devils. Let's say you have 500. Let's say you have 1,379 devils. That's still not too many that the Lord could not set you free because he set the maniac of Gadara free. So the point I'm just trying to make is this. You know, we have to be careful as Christians because we saw from the last video that, yes, someone can reach a point of no return. They can cross too many lines to where they become what we refer to or well, what the Bible calls them, a reprobate. They can sear their conscience to where their mind is no good, no moral compass, and now they're reprobates. But we as Christians have to be careful in uh, how who we identify as reprobates because, again, if the Lord is capable of setting free someone that is possessed by up to 2,000 demons, then that shows us the magnitude of God's saving grace and, and mercy and what he's capable of doing, his regenerating power. Okay, so uh, we could write someone off as a reprobate and, and make the mistake of, of, of not recognizing that as vile or as wicked as that sinner may be, but he really isn't a reprobate. Uh, God knows his true spiritual condition and God, he can save people much worse than you can even imagine. And, uh, and I pray, praise the Lord for that, right? So uh, we have to remember that God, uh, well, as Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack, uh, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell, no matter how vile and depraved and wicked that person is. God loves everybody. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We preach a whosoever will gospel, okay? So if someone is a reprobate, it's not so much that God cannot save them it's more so the fact that they have they refuse to let God save them. Let me clarify something. If I didn't make it clear enough in the last video, let me try to make it more clear uh, in this follow-up. It's not God that makes someone a reprobate. It's the sinner that rejects God that makes themselves. They make themselves reprobate through their bad decision to reject God. He said, because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. That's not something God did. That was their choice. Man has free will. They made the choice to not have God. So really all God is doing is giving them what they want. You don't want God? Well, fine. God is not going to force himself upon anyone. You know what? You want to know why? He could if he wanted to, right? But the reason why God's not going to twist your arm is because that wouldn't be true love. And God is love. And because God is love, he wants that love to be reciprocated. And so if you're going to love God, he wants you to love him out of your own free will. In other words, he wants your love for him to be sincere and genuine because out of his sincere and genuine, genuine love for you, he sent Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul. And Jesus Christ, out of his love for you, he sacrificed, sacrificed voluntarily, willingly laid down his life on the cross because that's how much he loves you. Greater love have no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. So make no mistake about it. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. God didn't want any reprobate. God, God didn't want any of them to go to hell. They made themselves reprobate. That wasn't God's choice. That was their choice. God has done everything that he could possibly do so that 
anybody could get saved. I don't care how wicked they are, how vile they are. You can have up to 2,000 demons and the Lord will still save you. He'll still set you free. He'll still deliver you and forgive you of all of your sins. That's how powerful our God is. If he could change the maniac of Gadara who was possessed by 2,000 demons, he could change you too into a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And so have become new. So we preach a whosoever will gospel. All right, do not mistake what we teach as far as someone becoming a reprobate, what, what I tried to explain in the prior video, do not mistake what we're teaching to what the, the Calvinists teach. And I'll do a separate video, uh, look for that one, on the Calvinist version on the doctrine of reprobation. We don't, we don't believe it that way because it's, it, it's not the way the scriptures teach it. The Calvinists teach that before cre the creation of all mankind, God had already predetermined who was going to go to heaven and who was going to go to hell. So basically, because it's all based on God's predetermination, that would inevitably make everyone that he chose to go to hell reprobates. That's the Calvinist doctrine of reprobation. It's a damnable doctrine. It, it's one of the worst doctrines you can imagine because according to that doctrine, then uh, that would have even non-elect babies going to hell. And when I do that video, I'll quote from Calvinistic resources to show you that there are Calvinists that taught that even non-elect babies will go to hell. What a horrible doctrine. That's not what the Bible teaches, but I don't want to go too far off on, on that tangent. We'll save that uh, material for another video. But just know this, in answer to someone's question, what if, an, uh, uh, what if a reprobate were to call on the Lord for salvation? Well, then that would prove that they're, they're not a reprobate. A reprobate is a reprobate because he has chosen once and for all to not have God. He does not want God. Okay? That's what a reprobate is. Uh, to elaborate a little bit further, uh, l let me give you an example of... Uh, a whole generation of reprobates. In Genesis chapter 6, remember the story of Noah? Genesis chapter 6, uh, a horrible story, but God destroyed the whole world by a flood, a worldwide flood. And the only exception of people that were not destroyed in that, in that flood was Noah and his family. You know the story. They were the only people left on the planet that believed in God or that loved God. And so they were the only ones God could spare. And, uh, you know, I've preached on this many times or touched on it in many sermons that God really, he, he didn't have another choice but to destroy the whole world because uh, the devil was so successful in those evil days to corrupt all of mankind that he was, all, he was down to just one family left to corrupt, the family of Noah. God had to spare Noah's family by destroying the rest of the world and basically resetting things, rebooting the system, because if he would have allowed the devil to reach Noah's family and corrupt that family, it would have been game over. All of He would have been successful in corrupting an entire generation of humanity. And then it's game over. So God didn't let the devil do that. Uh, he destroys the world, all of depraved humanity. And someone could argue, man, and people have argued, that's so horrible. I can't believe God would do that. You have to understand something here, okay? Uh, you have to understand man ha has made up their minds. I'll read it to you. Genesis uh, chapter number 6. Uh, verse number three, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh. So this goes hand in hand with what we read before in the prior video in Romans chapter one. God reaches out to man. God, uh, he has his Holy Spirit reproving the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. The Holy Spirit is doing everything he can to draw people to the Lord. 
But when man rejects God, listen, God is going to eventually reach a, a, a point uh, where, uh, where he says, you know what? I'm not going to waste any more time trying to convince someone who has already made up his mind to not love me. Why waste my time on that person when there are billions of others on the planet? Okay, God will move on. God will move on. Okay, and um, in Genesis chapter number six, the Lord says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. When God, listen, God, God is a very patient God, but when his patience runs out, you are in trouble. God's patience can run out. And he says in verse three, for he, for that he also is flesh, Yet his day shall be in 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. Let me go down to verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And notice this. Pay very close attention to the detail here. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. With the, with the only exception of Noah and his family... The rest of humanity, the Bible said, that they were so wicked, so corrupted, that the thoughts of their heart was only evil. Do you understand what the word only means? The thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. That's a reprobate mind. These are people that have made up their minds they don't want to have anything to do with God. They have totally rejected him and they're not going to change their minds on that matter. So God had no choice but to reboot the system, so to speak. And then that's where you get the story of, of uh, Noah building the ark. Okay, uh, it, it goes on to uh, explain here in Genesis 6, verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence and God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt. All of humanity was corrupted for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So God had no choice but to start all over again with Noah to repop and, his, and his family to repopulate the earth, okay? Uh, Come with me to Romans chapter number nine. Let me give you the example of Pharaoh just to illustrate what a reprobate is. In, in Romans chapter number nine, think about Pharaoh in the days of, of, of Moses. He's mentioned by the apostle Paul as an illustration in Romans chapter number nine, verse 17, for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared uh, throughout all the earth. Verse 18, therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Now, the Calvinists will look at that verse and, and use that to try to prove what they call unconditional election. See there, they'll say, see there, God does choose certain individuals. He'll harden their heart. That's reprobation. That's unconditional election or the result of it. He'll choose uh, who's going to be wicked and who's going to go to, to hell. Again, that's such a horrible doctrine. It, it basically makes God the author of sin. It, Calvinism is the doctrine that makes God worse than the devil. But again, let me not go down that <laughs> that rabbit trail for now. But notice, Paul reveals to us that God hardens the heart of Pharaoh. But what you need to understand is before God ever hardened the heart of Pharaoh, Pharaoh hardened his own heart first. Let me repeat what I just said. Before God hardened the heart of Pharaoh and then decided to make an example out of him, that he might that God might be glorified Pharaoh had already made up his mind to harden his heart against God first so again do not blame Pharaoh's fate on God no 
Pharaoh, uh, he paved his own way through his rejection and blatant rebellion against God. He made up his mind. And once you make up your mind, God honors your choice. God will give you what you want. You just might not like what you get. Now, let me prove that to you in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. And in verse number, Exodus 3, verse, verse 19. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and, and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And ye shall uh, say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go. We beseech thee uh, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord uh, our God. Okay, so notice, God is... Uh, telling Moses what to say, okay, and when you get to, when you get to uh, chapter 8, God reveals to Moses that he's going to confront Pharaoh and demand for Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go free from the bondage of slavery they were suffering in Egypt. Let them free and let them follow the leadership of Moses unto the promised land where they can settle as a nation and worship God. Well, Pharaoh is, is not going to, he's not going to comply. And uh, when you get to Exodus chapter 8, uh, verse number 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, notice, he hardened his heart. And hearkened not unto them as the Lord said. The Lord predicted. I, I know Pharaoh well enough to know that when you, when I send you to confront him and to demand for him to let Israel go, he's going to rebel. Okay? And, uh, and the Lord called it. He was right. Pharaoh uh, did not obey the command of God through God's servant Moses. But notice how the, the word of God words it there. He says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. The reason why God hardened the heart of Pharaoh is because Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Okay? Uh, look at uh, chapter 8. We're there already. Verse 32. Again. Exodus 8, 32. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. At this time also, neither would he let the people go. Over and over again, Pharaoh hardens his heart and rejects God, rejects the God of Israel, refuses to cooperate and to comply. He that hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Why? Well, because they hardened their neck. They hardened their hearts. L let me give you one final e example in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay, just to make this point, what I'm trying to clarify here is this, a, a reprobate is, it becomes a reprobate, not because that's what God chose or, or that's what God wanted. No, God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. A reprobate becomes a reprobate because they chose to reject God and they have made up their minds that they are not going to comply. They are not going to obey they are not going to accept God. Well, what do you do when someone refuses to cooperate? Or do you force them? In God's case, God's not, again, let me repeat what I said earlier. God's not going to force them because if, if God forced them to receive him, that would not be true love. God wants you to love him sincerely because love is a choice. God wants you to make the choice to love him, but God's not going to force you to love him because that wouldn't be true love. God wants a true, genuine, sincere, loving relationship with you. But if you don't want that with God, I don't know why you wouldn't want that with God, but if you don't want it, okay, God's not going to force you. But don't complain when you suffer the consequences for that bad decision because the consequences for rejecting God are eternal. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is my final verse, and I'll be done with this uh, little lesson here. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, in the context, it's talking about the future Antichrist 
uh, who's going to be the devil in the flesh, the devil disguised, uh, the man of sin, the son of perdition, who is going to deceive the world into worshiping him as God. Paul reveals that in this same chapter in verses 3 and 4 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He's going to establish a one world government and a one world religion through which he will deceive the world into worshiping him. And you can read more details of that in Revelation 13 as well as Revelation 17, Revelation 16. But let me read to you why in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, why is God allowing folks or why will God allow folks to be so deceived by the devil? Why is God letting this happen? Well, Paul's going to answer that question for us. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 9, speaking of the Antichrist, it says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Notice the deception. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Notice, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. That's why God allows mankind to be deceived by the Antichrist. You want to know why? Because they already made their choice. They chose to reject Jesus Christ. They chose to reject the truth. Well, guess what? If you reject the truth, the only other option for you is a lie. If you reject what is true, then what's left is what is false. It's, it's either one or the other. You can either have the truth or you can have what is false. If you reject what is true, then the only thing left is what is false. And so God, God's not the one making anyone a reprobate. God's not the one forcing anyone to be deceived or, or to go to hell. No, they choose that for themselves by rejecting God, by rejecting the truth. Uh, he, he goes on to say, verse 11, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Why? Why would you do that, God? Well, verse 12, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but he, he, he gives you the answer. He explains why. Why is God allowing folks to, to fall for a strong delusion that's going to lead to their damnation? Well, the answer is plain and simple. They believed not the truth. If you believe not the truth, the only other alternative is a lie. The problem is that lie is going to cost you big time. It's going to result in eternal damnation. And then, not only does Paul answer that question, but the Holy Spirit leads him to give us the reason why man rejects the truth. You want to know why people reject the truth? You want to know why people reject the gospel? You want to know why people reject Jesus Christ? He says that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The number one reason why people reject Jesus Christ and the truth is because they love their sin. Jesus made that plain in John chapter 3. They love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds, the things they're doing, their deeds are evil. They want their sin instead of Jesus. So when you choose that over Jesus who came to save you from your sin, then the only other thing left for you, the only other option, the only other alternative, if you reject the truth, is the lie. If you reject salvation, the only other alternative is damnation. So when it comes to a reprobate, let me clarify. God doesn't make you a reprobate. You make yourself a reprobate when you make up your mind that you don't want to have anything to do with God or the truth. That's not God's fault. That's your fault. So to answer the question, what if a reprobate were to ask God to save him? Well, 
that would just prove that he's not a, re a reprobate because God will never turn anyone away that wants to be saved. If someone, and I've, I've even heard preachers try to say, you better get saved now because if you don't, the Holy Spirit will leave you alone and then you'll reach a point where you might even call on God and cry and beg and plead for God to save you, but God won't do it. The Bible doesn't say that. That's horrible teaching. That's so unbiblical. Let me tell you something. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you want to get saved, God will save you today. He'll never turn you away if you truly want him. If you truly desire the truth, Jesus Christ, salvation, he'll give it to you. But once you've made up your mind that you don't want it, then you're on, your ro on the road to becoming a reprobate and it'll be no one else's fault but your own. Don't blame it on God. It'll be your fault, the choices that you make. All right. I, I, I think that answers the question. I hope it does. I hope it explains some things. God bless you.